Hi everybody, this is PD in post. I think I solved the audio mistake, um, which appears when we transition into the film. Um, I wasn't able to salvage the feedback in a way that, that I found nice to listen to. So I'm just going to go through and re-record um, everything that I said um, and, and dub it in. Um, so there's going to be some sections where you'll hear some weirdness behind me, um, where I converse with Robel, but for the most part, um, I've, I've gone through and fixed everything on my end. Well, thank you guys for joining me today, um, for this, uh, Jalen Green stream. I would like to welcome in our guest, um, for today's stream, which is Robel. How are you doing this evening? What's good, guys? I'm uh, glad to be here. I'm glad to talk about the most famous prospect in the class, Mr. Jalen Green, and I'm super excited. So let's let's, let's get to it. Yeah. Uh, appreciate everybody for uh, taking time away from NBA playoff basketball, even if the scoreline uh, doesn't necessarily look like it. There is playoff basketball happening right now. So I just want to thank everybody who's uh, who's showing up live um, and, and shout out to anybody who's uh, showing up late. Um, um, so what's, uh, what's your prior experience with Jalen? So other than Lamelo, Jalen's probably been like the one I followed the most. I mean, like, I think he went famous when he was about like 15, 16. And like people realized that he can jump like 50 inches off the ground. And it was really exciting, but, um, but sorry, I just got distracted by Francis' message. But um, yeah, like he could just jump out the gym, but like everything was a little bit raw. Like he can get to the rim anytime he wants because like the like you know the, the you're so fast and yeah, so like twitchy for his size. And yeah, like and it, it makes great highlights. So uh, that's why he got famous off of that. Like that's how I knew of him. Yeah. Um. So I got told about Jalen during his freshman year. Uh, I'm from the Bay Area, which is which is you know pretty close to Fresno, um, so it was definitely a name that was that was buzzed about, and uh, he played roughly the same as a freshman as he does now, um, and like that it jumps off the, the things he's able to do jump off the screen. So let's dive. Um, um, so let's. I want to stress that so, I tried to pick uh, an average game, a game that showed the strengths, that showed the weaknesses, that showed different styles of use. Um, if I just wanted to show, you know, one of the better versions of Jalen Green, you know, the this is what he could be version, I would show the Agua Caliente Clippers game or the Raptors 905 game um, or even a game, you know, without Jonathan Kaminga where he's on ball board. Um, while those are great games, they're not necessarily representational of his strengths and weaknesses. That's just, you know, a, a good prospect having a good game. And similarly, you can, you know, warp the picture entirely by focusing too deeply on on a negative game um, because, you know, for some people, this may be their first real deep exposure. And if you go too deep on on a bad game for the first time, um, you can make anybody look like they shouldn't be drafted. The first thing that I'm looking for is creative contact. Um, Green has a point two nine seven. Uh, free throw rate when you run it through the adjustments uh, accounting for the G League's two for one free throw rule change, um, which is good. Uh, Green wants to attack downhill, but he's not necessarily optimizing his physical gifts to getting fouled as much as possible. He prefers to have defenders contact late. He prefers to um, to get his fouls in air, and I think that he can do a better job of of getting fouled and using the physicality he does have. Um, which we're going to get into in the stream. The next thing that we're going to be looking for is offensive gravity. Um, defenses really have to react to the first step and the athleticism of Jalen Green. And I'm really interested in seeing how he processes that, um, how he handles the reaction to him, uh, the reaction to the reaction sort of. Third, we have big space slash small space handle. Green is extremely comfortable 
attacking in big space. His handle is, is predicated on, on being outside of his body. His handle is predicated on um, making sure that uh, aggressive players get punished by turning them downhill as quickly as possible. And on the other hand, he struggles when players can stay inside of his frame. He struggles when defenders can crawl up underneath. Um, the corollary to this is core stability. Um, skinny guys struggle with contact. They struggle with uh, center of gravity. And when players get under green center of gravity, when when they can be lower than him at the point of attack, he wants to retreat. He wants to turn small space into big space again, which has some meaningful results, but often um, it is it is an escape plan um, to, to reset, to try to attack again. And lastly, we have, you know, recognizing advantage creation. Green is really good at, at recognizing blow by opportunities and, and seizing on bad defender footwork. But when it's murkier, when, when a defender doesn't clearly have a disadvantage, he can hold the ball. Um, this will occur mostly on movement attempts. So Robel, what, of these sticks out most to you? Probably the last one that you said, like there's a lot of times where he could just catch and go. And, like since he's so bursty, just off, like from the standstill and just moving in general, just like sometimes he just pauses and like he just thinks, like he li- he likes jabbing a lot before he makes a move. Mm-hmm. And I think he just feels very comfortable with that. So I think that's why it's the reason why he pauses. But I mean, like it just, he passes out catch and shoot opportunities and some like, just like uh, taking advantage of the guy coming later towards him. So definitely that one is the biggest for me. Is there a specific element that jumps out to you? Um, in terms of that? In terms of, yeah, in terms of that. Um, not specifically. I, I think it's just something I just, uh, it just something, it was just like a small irk for me, like just kind of like a, a small annoyance. Uh, I know, I, I think that he likes jabbing uh, the opposite way of which he drives. I think that I started uh, picking up on. But I think it's just like, um, I think the reason why he does it is maybe because I, I feel like since he's like, he's grown up to be such an athlete in the ball and he just wants to, you know, blow by people, get to the rim as much as possible. Um, like, I feel like he always feels like he's going at a 100 and he's trying to like slow down. But mm-hmm. like, he still hasn't balanced that part yet. I mean, like, that's the hardest part with, like, trying to change your approach, right? Like, especially, I've, I was thinking about it with shooting too, like, like, slashers or just guys who are inside who, like, recently developed shooting, like, they kind of shoot too much because, like, they have this new skill and they're kind of, like, comfortable with it. So it's like, they just, he has to, like, balance it out. I feel like he just was always going 100%. And now he's just trying to, like, kind of go between, like, let me pause and think about what I have to do and... Um, actually take the advantage, so. So let's get into it. Um, this this first possession is a blank possession that just put it in there to, to give us a little space to talk. Um, we should note that we're, when we're watching G League teams, there's always variant talent levels and variant archetypes available. Um, this is uh, This is... Iowa, which obviously has uh, guards. It doesn't necessarily have the the NBA level big bigs. Um, we're going to start out with a rip screen coming and clears out to the weak side. Um, this is going to be a an action that determines whether we're in zone or not. Um, Iowa switches it, and because there isn't a, a, a movement on that weak side, um, you can see that it's a zone, and Green's read is to see if this man is going to help over or to stick. Um, then he gets into a, a dribble combo. He's reading the waist. Um, you can see he sees the defender actually reading the ball instead of the waist. And so Green sits down. What he was doing was actually just trying to to see where what the defender was reading. Um, it results in, in two feet in the paint. Um, so here we, we see it again in slow motion. We go through he has a chance to make the read misses the window sees that the far side is also not available as the zone still sitting there pulls it out it's the the combo to see the defenders you know style of reading the game that he gets it hard cross yeah i feel like there's there is one 
positive here though like especially in this move right here like there's like a little bit of wiggle that he doesn't hasn't always shown so and then like how he like evades that stun too just like that ball security hurts him and you gotta pass that like you can't shoot that at all all versus reading waste so when the defender declared like he was he was watching the rock and then he makes a quick decision and you can see that with chris paul with Millsap, where you he uh once once Millsap declares it it's a quick rip there that's a sign of of good long-term ball handling to understand that defenders read things differently and you can make an adjustment to how they are reading the game because for a guy who watches the waste you wouldn't do this. You would do a a move that corresponds to to that style of defender. So watching him watch a defender and make a read accordingly is really positive. I agree. You wanted to talk about the defense here? Yeah, um, I feel like... Let me see if I remember this clip exactly here. Um, oh, yeah. So I think J Jalen's like pretty decent at actually uh, executing schemes and stuff like that but like there's just sometimes like he's like a little step slow of like actually recognizing what's going on so here he's just like sagging off he thinks uh Trey's probably gonna go to the corner I mean like uh then you know goes back gets the back screen and like he's so behind the play he can't even like react and recover mm -hmm. so like you just see it again he just gets a what's it called um I forgot what that screen is called but um yeah, like I think the just the the awareness is a bigger issue than like um, the actual like I guess motor or like um, just like knowing what to do. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so let's get to one of the big. Here we're going to run an uphill DHO. The defender is lagging behind about a half step, so you can see that that top foot is, uh, is is still giving middle and that there's no defender there and that the big isn't drop. So on this catch, as he's seeing that middle, it's open. Were he to attack in this moment, he would have had advantage, but he waits a second, allowing the defense to resume shape, you know, to get into a, a compact help, you know, equidistant sort of space. And he has to balance taking risks with um, with making the right play. And I think here he he let advantage go and lost the balance between making the right play and, and being appropriately aggressive. Yeah, exactly. It's that balance thing I think I was just talk, telling you about. Like, uh, just I think he was just trying to, like you said, just make the right play, trying to see what's out there, but... Just gotta go sometimes. Like the space is there, just go. So I think it's important to keep a close eye on on closeouts on a possession by possession basis, because like. Because like this is his first time having positional and scouting report closeouts. I think. Um, so sometimes I'll push middle. Sometimes I'll push flat. Sometimes it'll you know be the wrong spot for the right wrong position. His best closeout ability is that if he doesn't beat people to spots, he has the agility to recover and make things difficult for them. Um, he's never going to be the strongest dude in the world. I mean, like Katie's a, a fantastic example. Katie's not the strongest dude in the world, but he's gotten to a level of stability where he can he can push people directions. He can hold spots and like like here, he doesn't need to to stonewall Tatum. He just has to push him towards help. He just has to have Kai on the front side, knows that he can't let him go to that, that front of the rim area and push him to the weak side. That's a success, and that's all that really has to be done. Will you be strong enough to be able to push people towards help? That's the test. Don't have to be Shemi. Don't have to be Marcus Smart. Just enough to push to help. Yeah. It is encouraging that he could get to that spot, though, and that he, that he mm -hmm. knows that he could kind of... I think, like, um, there was, like, an idea of more that... He was trying to um, push them baseline, like, at times. Mm -hmm. But, like, I think it was just sloppy. Like, I think it's just very raw, like, you know, just normal kid stuff. But, I mean, like, the tools is there and, like, just the willingness and he could do it. It's just, you know, the strength gain and just more refinement. It's certainly possible for him. But there is room for improvement. 
Um, he he does have a lot of slipperiness around screens. Um, this is going to be a pitchback that this is going to be a double stagger that turns into a pitchback. And I find that he has a really good job of getting over screens. He gets skinny. Um, he's able to reattach. Um, he can really bump out some lanes. Under is a is a totally different problem. But over, I generally find it be good. This action is designed to blur him out on the weak side of uh, in help side. So his responsibilities are going to be a little murky, which is difficult for a teenager. So this should be his responsibility, him being to the nail. But because he was off this double stagger, he thinks that his possession is over. So he's sort of mentally just focused on this guy. That's that's the effect of blurring. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I do like especially that how you can chase how well he's um, good at chasing guys off the ball. Like I mm-hmm. feel like uh, with guys well, like especially like just offensive prospects we just say oh just put them on the worst player like if they're wing just put them on the worst wing if they're guard put them on the worst guard but like he actually has a role that um you can actually tell him like you can put him on Desmond Bain and uh that's actually a time that he could do well in. like you know just like simplify it and I feel like he could have like a role where he produces positive value so I think like he can that's like the difference between him and like like I guess like um negative like potential negative defenders so we here we have the catch and hold he's guarded by briscoe with his hands down if he attacks the briscoe's top foot closest defender to stopping him from getting a dunk is standing directly under the rim but he catches it outside of his body so he has to bring the ball in before making a decision if he catches it on balance then there would be almost no problems either a shot decision or a a decision to attack and that time that it takes to regather is what allows the defense to reform and by the time that briscoe uh is able to get on balance green is ready to go um briscoe's hands still aren't up and the shot goes up i think it's two things happening here the first is that like he's wasting that advantage and the second thing is that like these catch and holds are really difficult to shoot out of and while he makes this one i do think at times the process makes his numbers look worse than the actual level of shooter and level of shooting improvement that he's done from when i've seen him when he was younger i think this is the worst of three choices so he could have attacked immediately you know seizing on that advantage he could have shot immediately seizing on that advantage and instead he kind of played it safer um and i think that that safeness is sparked by the unreadiness of the catch if he had caught on balance things would have been okay like we we're gonna see we see kispert here and like that's that's what catching on balance is is not necessarily the shooting that i'm looking to it's just are you ready to shoot when you catch the ball every single time bringing the ball down before shooting speaks to the catching and holding damaging his percentages because this is a shot made so much harder by his process here Here we are again to pick and roll defense. He's going to get skinny, um, which is the technical term, uh, around the screen. And G League ignites in a, in a drop coverage here, trying to prevent middle at all cost. And Green is able to stretch this play out, making it more difficult for there to be any kind of penetration, more difficult to, to get anything going. And this is both the system that Green is most comfortable where he gets his best results in terms of steals. Um, but it's also the one where he's most effective from a team perspective because he can create a little bit of havoc with with that uh, defensive acceleration. And when we look at this, we see a player that could be even better in time as he adds strength to his frame um, and can reattach it at multiple different angles. The uh, The gold standard here is Drew Holiday, who's not the biggest, the strongest, nor the fastest guy uh, in the in the guard stock in the NBA. He knows his angles. He knows his timing. He knows everything that like an offense is going to try to do him. By, by sitting in places where they're uncomfortable and, and using his strength and his agility um, as needed. Um, it allows him to, to really surprise ball handlers. Drew's a testament that like, you don't have to have a 50 inch vertical. You don't need to be uh, the wildest athlete. You don't need to, you know, bench press 215, uh, 30 times. It's just a matter of knowing where to be, when to be and how to react when you're there. Here we're in semi-transition. Uh, Nick's passes the wing, and it's a skip cross court. We can see that this time Green is catching, ready to shoot, his feet underneath him, eyes up, selling that that he really will shoot. Um, the The closeout is hard, and it results in to get good closeouts in the NBA. Green is going to need to be able to sell his willingness to shoot um, because teams do not want to end up on Sports Center. If you close out hard, this sort of thing happens where you get. A, a fantastic athlete downhill in space, um, which is it's a good way to have your big man hate you if you're a wing. Um, 
And if you're a big, it's it's not the ideal circumstance. You can really see the scoring gravity. You can see how much effort um, teams have to put in to keep him away from the rim. And and in the air, it really reminds me of Jamal Murray. Um, his ability to to contort himself, his ability to to find finishes um, in the air. The biggest difference being that Jamal has the shooting to keep defenses honest, and Green's going to have to add passing like this law. To, to get there. Things, like they also like it also looks like like even Jamal it looks like he's about to dunk it so like they're not really trying to contest like mm -hmm. Jalen is like kind of the same thing and just control his body so like that's definitely interesting as well it's like they're not really trying to make that decision so now it's just a small thing I noticed so next we have some off ball defense it's the exact same play that that got ran earlier um this time we're running it inverted um so double stagger and after the double stagger pitch get back and then they run the pick and roll to the outside so his responsibility on this play is to get to the nail you don't have to like always be a hundred percent there but you need to at least prevent the big from rolling down the center of the court and so his responsibility right now is for the slot defender and the uh the tag or at least the, the you know the the discouraging of the tag because there's a point guard low and you don't want point guards to contend with lobs. It's just not good business. A positive sign here is that Jalen recognizes his coverage and recognizes it a half second late. Um, it's not he didn't know what he was doing. He's just processing it a little bit slower. Um, and because of that slower process in the NBA, a half second is enough for a big man to get a layup. Um, that's the margins that we are working with. This reverse camera angle is perfect because we can see exactly where the, the nail is, the midline is, and where he should be. There should at least mm -hmm. be a shoe or something in this picture. And the fact there isn't is because he's late. And when he does enter the picture, it's... This is awareness thing again. Like, he still does do it. Like, it's just too late. Yep. Next, we have a, a big space closeout um, for really good athletes. This is always interesting because closeouts are a specific uh, and very strange type of athleticism um, because it involves covering big spaces, also stopping, starting, you know, hip turns, all of that at once. For those of you that uh, are repeat viewers, you, you've you seen the three lines, which are, you know, how far do you think that a person should be helping over because how far they can close down. Here, Green makes a, a solid, if a little too jagged, closeout, but is able to recover to to stay on the hip and, and Kuminga rotates to, to stop the play. I think that with Green, I would ideally want him to take really big leads. The only issue is that his wingspan's not tremendous. He's not it's 9 plus 10. I think it's like plus 2.5, plus 3. Um, so he's not going to be able to affect every shot, but his mobility does allow him to cover space really, really well. Next, we're going to get a little bit of the shooting. Um, I didn't want to dive too deep onto this because I think that it's mostly pretty good. We have a little bit of valgus collapse um, in the knees and the wrist does a lot of work, but it's it's generally um, in the positive signs of a rebuild. I didn't want to over analyze something that I think is making a lot of progress and making a lot of good progress. Um, the next two clips get into one of your biggest issues, Robel, which was uh, how his handle is going to move in space and how willing he is to be uncomfortable with his handle. I think that there are two bad habits he has with his handle. The first one being killing his dribble without a plan, similar to, to jumping. You don't want to kill a dribble without a, you know, an option of doing something positive. And then the, the second one is the second one is retreating away from pressure. So here we see that he makes this pass without the defense having any kind of shell or rotation to, to be afraid of. Um, they're just simply sitting back. And this is a dangerous pass that, that ends up being over-rotated on. It's because gambled on something they shouldn't have gambled on. There was a, lot, a, a miscommunication. Just want to see him be more comfortable in those small spaces, you know, probe a little bit more. Um, and then the second one, uh, Briscoe climbs into his handle after the rip through. There is a soft spot below that free throw line um, where the help side isn't. And what he needs to do is, is get straight there. If he gets there, he can really operate. There's a, there's a, a two on one basically on the backside. And Briscoe climbs all the way underneath, bumps him towards a dig, and bumps him towards that help at, at the free throw line. He does crack back into a help because the, there was a tie screen on the, on the front side. Um, this is that difficulty with pressure. This is his hip level being targeted. Um, and this is him not creating a style of contact that suits him um, because they, the, the Wolves were able to funnel him into a very uncomfortable position on this play.
looking at an exemplar of, of creative contact uh, is Kennedy um, using both her offhand um, when dribbling and her hip level to make her defender uncomfortable. Um, a thing that happens in professional levels is that when defenders know they'll foul, their hands will fall away. So she's really good at, at using her arm to brush uh, defenders away, losing, having them lose a little bit of balance, then bumping into them below their hip level to tip them over. Um, this causes, you know, a, a smaller player to be able to have finishing windows. And it's it's a micro skill that can get lost um, until you go back and be like, how is how are they getting all these buckets in this particular way? Next up, we have a, a little bit of space creation. Um, this isn't a a game with a ton of on ball. Here's his first step. There's step two. That's a lot of space. For our next micro scale, I wanted to, to look at the different ways of creating space um, and, and that not all step backs are created equal. Specifically looking at somebody like Jimmy Butler, who uses not just the footwork aspect, but creating contact first to, to get a multi-directional movement from the defender, so hitting them high to step back low. Um, it, it creates an imbalance, again, similar to what we just saw with Kennedy. Why I say all step backs aren't created equal is that you don't necessarily need to cover a huge amount of space if you're creating forces in other ways and, and making difficult situations for defenders using strength, um, using deceptiveness. There are multiple ways to create within a step back, and I just wanted to emphasize how much Jalen is depending on his actual steps and, and uh, the, the forces he generates pushing downhill and stepping back accordingly versus, you know, Jimmy, who needs to step back like seven inches on or something like this. It's not impossible or anything to, to live just based on big strides. It's just harder to have counters. Uh, more if you bump, if you uh, have another um, layer added onto it, it's easier to set up secondary moves, and it's also uh, easier to use different moves for different styles of defenders, something that Jalen is certainly going to experience at the next level, um, is, is teams throwing three or four different body types, three or four different positions at him to, to try to figure out what works best. As Alizé will testify, the way that Jalen Green's handle works is is as well suited to his physical gifts as any, you know, two guard that we've seen in a long time in that, like, he, def he knows that defenses are trying to get downhill, the gravity is moving that way, and he just needs to have a counter out of it. And that's lunges, it's big side steps, it's these sorts of moves, and adding those additional layers will will be what adds up other scoring opportunities because this stuff is going to be there. It's just a matter of how much gets added on top, how much uh, off arm craft, how much, how much handle development happens, how many other circumstances he can read out of this. Um, it, and that comes from this core stability that comes from adding strength. It comes from, from adding counters in time. Fun fact, we take a small break uh, to, to get a charger and I tinker with the audio settings, somehow making them worse. I swear this is the last time. I think I have it figured out. When thinking about average games, we generally think about offense. Um, I probably undersold how good of a defensive game this is for Green, especially for his tools. We're going to see a series of recoveries on this play that I think are pretty special. So it starts with uh, a, a missed rotation. He gets it a second late, but no danger happens. We get a closeout that... Is shaded towards middle. You generally don't want to shade middle. That's the danger spot on a court. And the offensive, the, the ball handler immediately sees it and is going to attack the bottom foot because there's good money in the middle. Green is able to recover, beat him to the spot, and force a change of direction, recovering to neutral advantage. So he goes from being behind to now being even again. Um, and this is difficult. Uh, not just that. Green then pushes back to the weak hand, so where I would say he, he should have been pushing initially, towards help. And is able to funnel the defender all the way into help and, and hold his position. He tries to spin and ends up being a turnover. This is, this is the benefits of, of Jalen Green, is being able to make mistakes and recover from them really quickly because of because of his quickness um, that he does have at times, you know, very young technique, but at other times when he does put the technique into action, when he does the, uh, what the scheme is asking, it's extremely effective.
It's impressive that he can get back to that spot, even though he literally gets pushed behind his back as well. Like, it's just the lateral quickness. It's always been there. Just um, kind of more willingness, but, like, yeah, the lateral quickness is insane. Controversial opinion. Nobody standing between Jalen Green and the rim is bad. And usually ends bad. Well, for somebody. The only rotation that is going to happen is from this baseline. The The top side can help, but it's just not going to work. So Jalen Green is going chest to chest with uh, the center coming from the weak side. Uh, he's able to, to, instead of going fully chest to chest, he puts an elbow out to, to shield the ball a little bit. Um, and his natural gifts allow him to hang in the air longer than basically uh, any prospect we're going to see in this class. Um, while the seven-footer's feet are on the ground, Jalen's still in the air, and it allows him to hang and finish. Um, this is uh, extremely impressive, especially so considering that he's really skinny. Um, Green often goes uh, into defenders, but he doesn't necessarily go through defenders. Um, it's it's common for him to, to hang and finish, um, but he's not a guy who's going to knock defenders back unless he has a full head of steam and they're standing straight up and down. Well, the strength level present some problems attacking the rim. The flexibility shown here and uh, the hand-eye coordination to do something like this is extremely impressive. Our final clip of the first half is is the isolation at half court. Um, the most important thing is that Trier is standing straight up and down. And when we look at the uh, defense's layout, there's nobody on the strong side of the floor. The strong side is, is wherever the ball is. So we have... Both bigs on the or both help side defenders on the weak side of the floor, and the on ball defender standing straight up and giving a free path to the rim if he pushes on the right side. Green's vertical pop and hang time are spectacular, and get a, a lot of meaningful attention. But the first step is elite. He gets to the paint in two point one seconds after about three strides. And look at the gravity that the entire defense has. You have four people with a foot in the paint because they're worried about Jalen Green going to the rim. One defender helps up, and so uh, he's reading both weak side defenders. Does, does the big step up? Does it stick with the corner? Is there a dump off available? And here we see a little more of the flexibility. This brings us back to our concept about creative contact um, and also to, to Jamal Murray. Um, I find Green to be a okay foul approach guy, but he's not hunting hip levels and he's not hunting arms and movement styles in the way that, like Jamal Murray does. Um, Jamal's not meaningfully stronger than Dwight Howard, you know, in I would say most categories, if not all. But what Jamal is doing is he's finding the moment of weakness where he can target Dwight Howard into a foul. And that, you know, using his shoulder, using his elbow, using his hips, he's he's finding circumstances where Dwight can't manipulate to recover. And that's the difference. Where it's like it's, sometimes it feels like Green is jumping and then in air making decisions where Jamal Murray is getting fouled before he leaves the floor. And that is a, a really important distinction. And that is a, a, well, a, a way of gathering fouls that is very re repeatable that we are seeing between Jalen and guys like Murray um, is that they're thinking contact first and then angle. And he's the inverse, like the, the gold standard, the, the absolute goat if this is Kyrie, who is able to just through obscene body manipulation, get shoulder to shoulder with anybody, get the contact he wants, then find the finishing angle afterwards, because he understands that there are limitations on what bigs can do with verticality. And so he's trying to get them to enforce verticality so that they think they're done, and then he manipulates out afterwards. So here we are with the free camera angle for whatever reason was super tight on the free throws. So of the, I think, five or six free throws that he took, um, there weren't any replays, and this was the only one that had his full release in there, so I cut in an extra one afterwards. Um, it's a little bit uh, from his opposite hip. Um, you can see that the valgus collapse. The thing that I find really encouraging is that he shoots from the index finger. It's a really strong follow through. Um, but there's a, a good, uh, there's a good motion from, from his gather point to his release point. Overall, I think that the free throw percentage is seems stable out of a loop play here. Um, we're going to get some, some chase pick and roll. Um, and the read that we're looking at is two on one on the weak side. 44 has two responsibilities, both under the basket and on the weak side with Kaminga. And Green has to read that. He picks up his dribble, but you can see that his eyes are still up. And when the defense botches the, the reattachment after the rotation, he's able to drop it off.
that this is a result of of good process after the pickup and bad pro bad process to get to the pickup. So he did well once the pickup happened, but that that particular mm -hmm. position was a bad spot to pick it up. So like, but you did mention that he did have like he did have struggles like picking up the ball up too early. So like, do you think that was an example where you just he did that as well? Because I thought so. Oh yeah, most definitely. Um, I would have preferred that he not pick the ball up because I think that read would have been there on a live dribble. Like killing the dribble didn't cause that rotation. That rotation was going to happen once the advantage ended. But there's positives with the patience, but not necessarily with the process. So I think that it reveals that there is um, an advantage seeking in how he is thinking. He just is trying to balance that with his uh, threat reduction in how he thinks about his handle. So I think that he thinks his handle is more rudimentary than we do, and that he's simply just trying to, to pull back and keep it safe. But we're at least seeing the playmaking sensibilities, the wheels turning in his head, and that as the handle develops, that stuff will be able to come out more. This play is a 2-3. Ball moves, he moves, his man moves, he moves. There's a cohesion with, with the scheme that is really encouraging. This is very positive from a movement sense for me. And here is the high horns play that you want to talk about. All right, so I think this is the one where uh, Jalen, I think he goes left. And I have just an issue with how he uses screens. It's like... Um, I know in this one, like he extended out a little bit and he should be going right, like have his head right next to the screeners. And like, he just does not do that. And like, um, like basically like better on ball defenders that are willing to go over, like they're just going to get into the dribble right away. Like it's like, he's not really, he has to make them feel the screen and he just doesn't uh, feel like, he doesn't make it a point to do that. Like he's like way too far apart from the screen here to me. Yeah, absolutely. It's it allows the defense to catch up. Yeah. And on NBA floor, you're not guaranteed to get multiple advantages on one possession. So anytime you have an opportunity to get advantage, it has to be seized because if you waste the only chance for real opportunity, the likelihood of, of a bailout shot or somebody having to create something out of nothing rises exponentially. And those are generally bad possessions. And by not sending defenders into screens, not being shoulder to shoulder um, with the screener, not, you know, enforcing that contact. There's an opportunity that is squandered, and this isn't mm -hmm. just a Jalen Green problem. This isn't, you know, just a Cade Cunningham problem. This is just a young ball handler problem that not sending guys into screens um, really hurts a possession because it, it allows a defense to recover and allows them to retain form much faster. So if there is an advantage, it, it lets them reshape and now you're back to nothing. And now you, as the creator, are in a much more difficult circumstance. I think part of this goes to the importance of the, the G League initiative, which is that it can, it can give players a unique circumstance where their mistakes are more heavily penalized. So, you know, Jalen Green has basically been able to get away with this because there hasn't been a defense that has been able to get in shape there hasn't been a defense that has been able to to beat him to spots and, and really punish him for you know bad screen crap. Mistake made, didn't work, you have to figure it out. We can watch him learn this on the fly um, as a young guard. Shout out to all my bigs in the chat watching now. You already know what this is. This is a foot race. Um, as a big that when the, the offensive five crashes the, the glass, you know you're ahead. You're sprinting for your life for a layup, for a dunk, for easy money. So this is a passing square. I apologize for the art. Um, I don't have a lick of artistic ability. Green is reading number seven, um, who has two responsibilities. Uh, the wing running to the corner, and he also has the big man because the big man won the foot race. So Green has a very small window to which to throw this ball as Dante Hall sprints towards the basket. Um, and I, I visualize with this, this is the window. If you throw it too close to that left side, seven can reach his arm out and get it. If you throw it you know, too far to the right, you can throw it too sharp of an angle. It won't work. Um, he's able to to get the pass through and and leads him a little bit. Um, it's not far enough behind that Hall really breaks stride, but it's not entirely on target, which would be ahead of him so that he can keep running, keep his arms out. And with bigs, um, because their hands are 
Not always great. And you just want to reduce as many variables as possible. Um, Green's passing was encouraging in the games that I saw. There's five or six of these hit aheads through through some pretty interesting windows. Um, and all of them came with a live ball. So I, I think that this, to me, is, is an encouraging sign of processing the game and understanding the angles of passing. To demonstrate a half-court view of this concept of, of passing windows and, and how they can work, um, here we have a clip from Gonzaga that has a 45 cut in it, so from out of bounds straight to the rim um, along the slot. The read is how hard the wing defender, which you hear as a Yai, is denying, and how far over Kispert is in help side. So if you throw it too close, AI deflects it. If you throw it too far ahead, Gisper can rotate, and that's most likely going to be a, a, a leak out going the other way. Throw it just right, it leads to something kind of like this. So um, I'm encouraging for like Jenny Green to uh, do have like a sense of exploring those windows because I I think the same as well. Like I think it, like he can really needle to in the past. Like, like that was the most encouraging thing about um, his passing to me. Yeah, absolutely. I think more than the actual passes themselves is the thinking through the angles at a, at a high level. Next up, we have double drag versus a 2-3 on the slot. Um, Green is going to stop and pop before uh, continuing down the middle. So he, he makes the read that, that the 2-3 is adjusted. Um, and instead of trying to, to rotate the whole defense, Green stops and pops and gets it out before the defense can step up. What jumps out to you? Um, like, I mean, like, what's it, it was, it was, it was supposed to be a stagger, so he reads it, um, goes left instead, because I think he sees, like, this goes too far, and then he sees a switch and just still pulls up, like, I, like, for me, honestly, I like, like, it was just better processing than I thought, like, I think Jalen Green sometimes, like, uh, like like you said, he was trying to make the right play, but um, I think he just follows the play a little bit too much and like mm. doesn't think for himself. I think in the other play I was talking about, like the horn set, he didn't really run his man to the screen because he was just like, all right, I'm just running the, four, the horns and I have to make a decision, you know, depending on the role and the uh, popper. But like he didn't think about like how he's going to set up his own advantage. So I thought that was a way better job of that. For as good as Jalen Green is fighting over screens, he does have issues with under, as we'll see on this particular play. So we get a, a good bit of play design, sort of masking this as a as a STS uh, screen the screener pick and roll that actually turns into uh, a quick pitch and go for the original guard. So just a lot of masking to get to middle pick and roll. And Green goes under both of these interactions. And on the second one, you can see how much space he gives and how difficult it is for him to close it down. Um, the footwork and, and the presence that was there on, on getting skinny isn't there reconnecting when going under. I think this is partially just due to him never having to do it um, in high school um, and, and AAU. A lot going on here. Um, we start with with a high DHO that turns back into a pick and roll to the left. Green retreats like we see him uh, most comfortable, and he sees that the defender has it a high top foot and that the center is being cleared out. So he's going to hit the accelerator as hard as possible, attacking top foot, knowing that the side is going to be, the center is going to be cleared out. He gets downhill and goes a version of chest to chest, leading with elbows straight to the face, which is uh, ideal for, for skinny guys, shielding the ball back a little bit so it's, it's immune to being knocked away and pushing through. Again, here he recognizes that the defender can't hold this spot vertically and it has to lean, has to jump backwards and by attacking the defender, space gets a foul call. Tactically, there's a little bit more going on with this play. It's, uh, it's a DHO, but Green takes it all the way out and that way when they run the pick and roll, it's an easy switch switch back. So instead of being you know, a, a quick turn, the defense has time to communicate with it and to take good angles. The angles are in fact the angles are in fact so good that when Green attacks to his left, the defender, which is his original defender at the start of the play, is able to, to stop him flat and he has to retreat. Accelerator, again, different sort of athlete, and gets downhill. So there's goods and bads within this one. Um, 
And this is a mixed bag, partially due to his catch position, partially due to his want to, to pull things back. And I think that as he gets out of those habits, things will get a lot cleaner. Do you think um, him like willing to give up advantages is because like he's been so used to like getting anything he wants. So he's like, okay, if I don't get it that time, I'll be fine. Like I'm doing green, I can do it again. Like is maybe is that the reason why like he's willing to give some of them up? I think it's much more about the competition than it is uh, his approach. I think that it's never really mattered if he read his screen improperly or if he pulled the ball out because his defenses weren't setting. There wasn't going to be big rim protectors, you know, who were going to rotate every time. There weren't going to be defenders who were in position every single time. Um, and this is really the first time that we're getting exposure. And even still, he can still win um, at the point of attack. I mean, if you think about it this way, there just haven't been the sorts of people who could stop Jalen Green from getting easy stuff, even if he makes mistakes, up until this point of his basketball life. And why the G League is so valuable for him specifically is that he is faced with a learning environment where he can feel out some of those things um, on a possession-by-possession possession basis for the first time. Um, it's just really hard to get those types of, of dudes on a court in, in a uh, EYBL or, or high school setting. And so this is the environment for him to, to experiment and see like, okay, so if I read the screen wrong, like I, I straight up can't get to the rim unless somebody makes a mistake down. And I think that's what makes this a constructive learning environment for a player with tools like this. Next is a shooting question that I get a lot, which is, you know, what do you do when a player's knees collapse inward? It's called valgus collapse. Um, it happens when a uh, player's hips are too tight and they have a struggle generating power. It basically means they don't access their posterior chain. It's fixable. I mean, there are guys who shoot in the league with this. I mean, Katie is a, an example that we like talked a little bit about earlier. Like a general same body type. The long-term solution is uh, strength training and flexibility training for the appropriate muscles. Another recovery. Um, it starts with a, an uphill DHO with and Green gets caught a little bit. He gambles on the steal, doesn't get it, and he's behind the play now. But he fights all the way back, and now we are even. Gets a, a slight bump, and then gets stepped through. Um, the the Wolves player misses the shot, but it's a, it's a good battle. Um, for all intents and purposes, he should be out of this play um, when, when he's on all fours. Instead, he battles back, and the foot issue rears its head again. He is now pushing the ball handler middle, which is a no-no. Look how much help he has to the right side. Another bump. I feel like he's good for one good stability effort, but if it's if it's a sustained stability, he's going to present some issues. Um, I would say overall, it's a very good play. Our next play is uh, a combination middle pick and roll. And then I believe it's supposed to be a Nick screen um, or, or a step up screen, depending on, on what terminology you use. Uh, Donta Hall gets the timing wrong, I think. Um, and the player we're reading is highlighted that is, uh, is Alan Cheatham. If he steps middle, then the, the pick and roll on the Nick side should go off without a hitch. So after the ball swing, swings to green, what we're left with is two defenders on the high side. Um, one middle defender on, on the low weak side block and the screen coming up. Um, his impulse is to take it middle, which is where the teeth of the defense is. Um, I wish that he had jabbed the other way and then used the screen. Um, when he, when he does use the, uh, the step up screen, they are icing it. So the thing that needs to happen is he needs to, uh, be patient and, and work the ball down towards that baseline and, and try to find a solution as Kaminga flares, uh, instead he picks up his dribble, um, which basically kills the advantage for the possession, giving the defense exactly what it wants, and it results in a charge for Kaminga. This is why seizing advantage is so important. The moment where this was, you know, uh, really lost, it wasn't with the Nick screen being off on timing. It wasn't on the jab the wrong way. It was when Green decided to pick up his dribble because he was uncomfortable moving towards the corner against ice. This is one of my favorite plays from... This is one of my favorite plays of... This game, it's Green's ability to read defenders. Here we're in a matchup zone, I think. And Green is reading number 44 because as the ball moves, he's going to decide to shake, so slide along the three-point line, to find a better uh, passing angle and force an extra rotation. The goal is to force as long of a rotation as possible. Here he forces a rotation that brings 44 down. He's able to hit the one more, and it leads to this semi-easy bucket. Um, it also would have been a 
a wide open shot for Knicks had he chose to. If your team has ever been Warriors before, where you know the one defender has to read Steph and Clay and whichever one they pick because they're both moving along the three point line in a shake, uh, is the wrong one because there's one more waiting to to one of the best shooters of all time. You you know how particularly deadly this can be. Um, it's just a great sign for a young off ball on ball player having adaptability between those positions and understanding where they can fit in and the ability to read a defense and act accordingly. It's a great bit of read and react. It's encouraging for a player who hasn't spent a ton of time off ball to to process as quickly and to get how the court dynamics work off ball with regards to their own shooting gravity and their own gravity attacking downhill. Here we have a, a shake from Nap- Raptors 905 against, uh, funny enough, the Ignite. So Ignite's in a 2-3, and we're going to have three different players shake. We're going to have the, the far player have a choice between uh, shaking to the corner or shaking to the slot. The, uh, the big at the free throw line is going to, to pop out, out and then or the other guard is going to dive. So we have as much ball movement as you can possibly get on this one. I mean, it's the kitchen sink. So we get a pop, we get a, a dive, we get a, a lift from uh, from the middle to the slot. These movements off ball have to really be felt by a defense or bad, bad things will happen. Um, for anyone that may doubt the uh, efficacy and uh, excess knows of the G League, I can't recommend the Raptors 905 enough. And if you're a youth coach, I can't recommend stealing this particular uh, zone buster because it is intense. All right, we're entering the end of the game. Uh, Wolves are, are trying to trap or foul. We have swing, swing, and now we're in the dangerous situation that we highlighted earlier of Jalen Green attacking downhill, and that's where he jumps from. That red line. Um, the ability to convert that kind of horizontal space into an easy layup is really special. Um, while this wasn't the, the best game from him from a high-flying um, highlight perspective, his the, his style of movement, his bounce is extremely actionable. Like it shows up in his games, even the ones where he doesn't try to dunk on people, uh, you know, four or five, six times. He's capable of threatening a defense. Should it make mistakes? Should it give sloppy closeouts? Should it get a little too aggressive with him? He's capable of converting that kind of space and, uh, with his flexibility and bounce. If you are looking for games where he is getting downhill all the time, um, I think the Cleveland Cavaliers G League affiliate uh, whose name I'm I'm blanking on is the one. I think that's also the game where he goes like fully diagonal on a on a double clutch layup, and and you see the flexibility really consistently in that one. So Robel, how did you feel like Jalen Green did with the creative contact and uh, winning on his own terms in 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 regards to the fouls for this game? Um, I felt the same as you. It's just like, uh, but I do think it is a little hanging fruit for him mm, to fix it. Most definitely. Yeah, because like, just just the idea of like, I mean, obviously the tools is there, especially like flexibility wise. But just the idea of like knowing like um, in which way to contour your body. Some players just do it just to do it, right? Like just to get a better angle of the rim. But like he just does it to avoid the contact. So, um, but there was one play. Um, I don't remember exactly what it was, but like, uh, like where he blew by the guy, and um, he got up like a little bit earlier because uh, like he saw the defender help late. So I felt like using that horizontal explosion just to jump a little bit earlier than the defense thinks. Like that's way to get fou- that's a way to get fouls. Um, thank you, uh, Francis. It's thank you, Francis. Charge. Um, I think that's a way to get fouls, just jump in early when, like, the defense expects it and just go and, like, body to body. I feel like that um, also minimizes some strength issues that he has, just being there to spot earlier. And, um, I mean, it's also just a craft thing, right? Like, uh, and just a mentality shift. I don't think it's, like, a, a huge wiring thing. Like, I don't think he's scared of contact. I just think, like, um, just the approach is a little bit. Yeah, I'm not suggesting like that, that Green is afraid of contact because I think, if anything, he's too uh, 
eager for co collisions, but not eager for contact, if that makes sense. So a lot of young, younger guys, and especially a lot of younger skinny guys are told like, go create contact, go get fouled, but they aren't necessarily like adapting how they create the contact to m make it most advantageous for them. So like we talked about with Jamal Murray, um, like we talked about uh, with Kennedy, um, with, with Kyrie, it's finding fouls early and making sure that you are getting fouled in a way that you can still finish, that you can always adapt and find the angle later. Um, I think that his biggest concern is that he just like wants to jump into people. And there's a diminishing return on that when you can't knock them back. Like if the ref doesn't call it, I feel like there are times where he has to really bail himself out with his, uh, with his dexterity where if he were to collect those fouls on the ground or if he were to collect them um, in a way that he could adapt and mid air better instead of just going headlong cannonball style onto somebody, um, that, that makes it a little more difficult. And that's the sort of thing that I would like to see him adapt. So do you think this is, could be fixed in like an off season or does this, is this like live game reps, like real like NBA game reps? Like how do you think like this approach is fixable? Uh, Kyrie similar, um, a guy who is really hard to move off of his spots, even though he's not built, you know, uh, in a way that like you would think of him as, as like a Desmond Bain or it's like, yeah, it's a guy you can't move. So let me ask you this. Um, how did you feel that his offensive gravity uh, was deployed in this game? What did you think were the strengths and weaknesses of of how he responded to defenses game plan for him? That seems to be big for him. Um, I think just a weakness is just like, uh, like just the passing is like my issues like with it is like, uh, it's not proactive. Like mm -hmm. when he's, when he actually does decide to take the advantage and he's going downhill, he already has one thing in mind. He's just like, how am I going to do it? So if, like, uh, when he blew by Trier, um, he was just like, he looked at the big man and he was just thinking, okay, how am I going to control this way? Like how is the, the big man going to guard me? But like the dump off pass is right there as well, right? So, um, because the guy, I think the big committed early. So it's just like having two things in mind. I think it's like it's something he struggles with. It also showed up in the um, the one I talked about, the points play where he doesn't uh, think about the advantage. He just thinks about, okay, I gotta see uh, what the defense is gonna do. Like I gotta see if Todd or um, the role is open. Like he doesn't realize he actually has to be the one creating that advantage. Think just keeping two things in mind at the same time is an issue for him. So I don't think like he still he still has some ways in like how to uh, take full advantage of that gravity. Mm -hmm. um, how that is fixed? It's my my issue is like it's going to be a I don't know exactly how to develop that because there he has been in like a a standpoint where I mean in senior in high school he was just a primary right he got all the ball screens that he wanted. And like, it didn't improve that much, right? Like, it, like I don't think that uh, that approach worked for him. So, uh, just like maybe he just has to have like a more off ball approach and just like um, more of a urgency, I guess. Like, be like uh, convinced more of an urgency, so um, he can process things faster and he doesn't have to think about uh, being patient and. Uh, like just learning how to be more reactive, like proactive instead of trying to balance out like going 100% versus like 50 to 100 like you know like I just think like trying to keep things simple in his head is probably most important but not in like giving him a ton of usage on the ball yeah I think that it's informative to, to look at past examples when you think about like quality of reps um, like reps themselves aren't particularly meaningful unless a defense can force uh, uncomfortable and new decisions. Um, I think about Jason Tatum, who had this problem where he could kind of get whatever he wanted to at high school level. And it led him to get what I would say was like board shot selection, where he would just take these like 18 foot fadeaways guarded by like six three, six four wings. And there would never be, like, a, a proper explanation for, like, why he took that shot defensively. Like, they weren't forcing him into anything. It's just like, yeah, I chose to take this shot because it, it was a shot I wanted to take. Um, and with Green, there just wasn't necessarily defenses that could consistently force him to make these uh, high-level passing reads or, or, you know, crawl into his handle and, and force these 
uncomfortable downhill passing decisions. Um, so I think that while he did have a lot of primary reps, the the type of rep that was valuable for him was the shooting rep. Um, he generally made a lot of strides um, shooting off the dribble. I think it's mostly unfair to ask high school players to develop in multiple ways as as on the on the ball um, in one season, and that the growth off the dribble was um, more than I was expecting, and like also asking for passing might be a little bit greedy. I think that's a natural segue to the handle, um, the big space, small space handle. Iowa's guards were built specifically to stop him. Basically, they're they're bigger, stronger guards that can climb underneath his handle, um, messing with his, his higher hip level. Um, and also Green's predilection for picking up his dribble. Um, do you feel the same way? Yeah. Um, uh, guys in the stream watching, uh, it's Victoria Day today in Canada, so there's some firework. I don't know if you guys hear it, but my bad if you do. Um, I do feel the same way. I think, like, um, like I don't think he makes it a point to go low that much. I thought that was a big issue in high school as well. And, like, there's also some ball control issues where, like, the dribble is kind of high at times, especially when, like, he's trying to drive. And, like, I think that's why he picks it up. So I think those two things are, like, my biggest issues with the handle and small space, especially. Compare it to, to Jalen Suggs, who's, you know, keeps – the ball really close generally and doesn't expose it to hang dribbles and the, the logic for Suggs is that he wants to to be close to his body so that he can just explode through any 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 tilt off balance any small crevice he can use his stronger frame to you know turn a a small gap into a larger one um on the flip side green does the same logic but from the opposite he's wide swoopy to get those same to get that same off balance from a defender but his is, is also from the component of he doesn't want people super close to touch him. Um, and if they do climb in and they do make a mistake, then it's over, over. But that's generally how he approaches things is is to to be wide, big, swooping handle, big hang dribbles, big crossovers. And the, the times where he is inside of his frame is more to read the defender and see how they're defending him than it is to um, than it is to, to stay compact. So I think that there's going to have to be the frame adjustment is going to be essential and also, you know, that style of handle is generally suited to bigger space. Here is where in the chat, uh, I learned that very, for the very first time, um, Jalen Suggs may have played some football. It's never been brought to my attention before. I don't know any fact less than the fact that I know that Jalen Suggs played football. Um, I learned that Jalen Green also used to play football when he was younger, so that was interesting to me. Yeah, I mean, play more. Playable sports, so yeah. it's essential for, for movement skills. The core stability and the core stability and the seizing on advantage are sort of the same thing to me because I think that they're uh, as related as anything could be. Um, I think a major difference between somebody like Jalen Green and and Anthony Edwards was that like Ant was capable of covering up. Uh, feel yeah. mistakes by just being stronger than than people at a college level, and also Ant played at a college level, and uh, and Jalen Green played against pros. Um, so whatever physical um, slightness he had is is exacerbated by playing against pros versus playing even in the SEC. Um, and I think that that ability to cover up your mistakes with physicality um, allows for like taking more gambles, um, and we're with Jalen because he doesn't have that. I think that at times he can become hesitant and I would just like to see him make more mistakes uh, and, and more mistakes of, uh, of aggression uh, with his handle. Um, I do think like this, I don't think it really showed up here at all, but in other games, I do think there was like some flashes of him using the offhand. So like when they would, like when he'll beat a guy and they'll try to get like, you know, um, bother his dribble. Like I think he has uh, show flashes of keeping them at bay, which was interesting to me. So I think like, um, it's intriguing because, I mean, not intriguing. It's, um, I guess, I would say less worrisome because it is in his head that he is trying to fix it. And I think that is, using the offhand is a great way to, you know, like, mask some uh, ball control issues. So I just wanted to point that out. Yeah. Um, so let's flip over, over to Q&A. We're still picking up uh, Robel. So no further audio engineering concerns. Uh, do I need to make? I don't think I need to make any change, changes. If we change the screens, um, we'll start with uh, 
Um, we'll start with the question from Drew, which is, uh, um, why does it feel like Green gets walled off defensively? What improvements does he have to make in terms of wiggles line finishing? Um, this is literally the same audio settings I had. Why does this keep happening? I hate this so much. <laughs> um, this is um, literally like I I did not change anything from. I uh, I will quintuple check and, and see how things look. But uh, so um, the question is, uh, why does it feel like Green gets walled off defensively? What improvements does he have to make in terms of finishing? Um. Um. Okay, never mind. I thought you wanted. I thought you were waiting for me to answer that one. Yeah, yeah. Go um, ahead. I mean, I like. I think the wiggles average, but I think it is there. Like, uh, I think in just big spaces, you just don't want to guard him. Um, he doesn't need doesn't need that many moves, honestly, to just get by when there's like when he does have like a when there's like open space around him. It's just like uh, in, like tight spaces, and when guys are really like close to him is then where he kind of gets nervous i think that's a good word for it like uh or cautious and that's where like like you said the risk taking isn't really there so he I, like i don't really think he gets forced to pick it up all the time i think it's just him being a little bit too willing to pick it up and that's why it looks like he gets so well yeah i th- i think that um i think that it's it's a core issue mostly um uh he doesn't have like a because because if people can stick with him he has struggles with um he has struggles with physicality um when people can stick with him and like struggle when guys don't struggle to keep up with his first step um it can look like he's getting like boxed in pretty bad um mm-hmm. i think that's just like the guys who can give him trouble really give him trouble i think more than like anybody in the class there is a type of guy who gives him trouble um and he will in terms of finishing it's it's more about his approach um, about collecting uh fouls early versus fouls late um i don't think there's like i think his wiggle is fine like he is very shifty when he wants to be he sells his moves very hard um it's a matter of getting to the point where like the other stuff where like when he is just dribbling, when he is trying to get in spots, making sure that those things are never uh, crowded or never, um, you know, claim territory. That's the thing that, that I would like to see handle. Um, I'm pretty fine with it generally. Um, our next question is, if, thank you. Thank you anyone for supporting the Patreon. Um, Every every one of these, we get closer to me figuring out audio issues. Every one of these, we get closer to, uh, you know, uh, me uh, being able to give you guys the, the stream you guys deserve. Um, uh, thank you to anybody who does support that. It really has changed uh, my life. Um, what are your thoughts on Jared Butler and Raekwon Gray? Uh, I have both my top 30. You want to take this one real quick? Yeah, uh, there is fireworks in the background, so it's not bad. that one. It's, uh, it's 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 not okay, that bad. Okay. Plan. All right, so uh, I'll start with Rickon first because I like him better. Uh, Rickon Gray is like interesting, like kind of has some zahan in his game, just like kind of the joke uh, that people have made before. Um, for a six eight guy, there's like a very like interesting amount of skill there. Um, like he shoots pull up jumpers. Um, can get to rim. Is like as physical as ever. Him versus Virginia was like, like they had Trey Murphy on him and like he just embarrassed him, put him under the basket. Sam Hauser was in hell. Like it's like there is like some, um, there is like there's like a high skill level skill level there that for his size and his weight, which is very like shocking when you watch Florida State for the first time. And then like there's still that application of physical strength that he doesn't really shy away from that makes him uh definitely like top 40 guy to me right so i would say that and then uh jared butler just like i think he's a backup guard more than um like a secondary creator kind of in like uh the malachi flynn mold i think he's more shiftier uh burst is really there i will say though like with jared butler people have concerns about the burst malachi flynn did improve it and i could say that as watching a ton of Raptors games, he did improve that in the league. 
and I think uh, Jared Butler, uh, it could have 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 the same thing could happen to him. So like, even though guys are like twenty two years old, an NBA strength and conditioning program is still make differences. Just wanted to point that out. But um, not really a guy like that. I really love probably um, top thirty five, like in the forty range. Uh, I mean, like you know, he's just good good shooter. But I don't, I don't really love backup guards in the, in a sense, even if like they have a potential to be as good as like a Malachi Flynn or something. I think that um, that archetype is like, at the end, they still pretty replaceable. So that's just my thoughts on those two. Okay. Uh, next question is from Dr. Doom 91. How confident are you in Green's pull up jumper? Uh, I'll handle this one first. I'm very confident. Um, he takes it with a lot of variety. Um, numbers were good and the difficulty was high. Um, I my biggest issue with this pull up jumper is that you may be confounded at times because of this issue of getting by people. Um, it was there were times where I thought that he was disengaging from um, from the rim to take side steps or or T max, and I think as a guy who slashes and shoots pull up threes is a very intriguing idea. Um, but it's not necessarily somebody that I'm in love with because I think that there is the, the passing ability. And to me, it's the it's the connector pieces that, that I'm most interested in because like there are real passing flashes operating at a pick and roll. He was making like good bounce pass reads, which is something I was um very excited in uh, about. Um so I th- I think that I'm very excited about him long term as a pull up jumper. I wouldn't say it's like the most certain bet in this class, but it's very good. Um, are you in about the same place? Yeah, uh, just a little bit higher than than you, but like about the same thing. Like you just obviously don't want him to rely on it too much, but I mean he could certainly create space for it. And there's just a ton of low hanging fruit there with the extra separation, like you said, with the with the bump instead of stepping back, um, just things like that. Uh, willing to take contested shots, and the touch is certainly there. So I think I'm just a little bit higher than you. I think. I would have him in top five pull-up shooting bets in this class. So um, I don't know if that's high or not compared to other people. I haven't talked about that really yet, but I think I'd still have him there. Okay. Um, the next question is uh, from Sawyer. Uh, on, on a Kings Post Pulse podcast hell long ago, before the Ignite season, you said Jalen Green wouldn't be a particularly good fit for the Kings. Do I still feel that way? Yes, but much less than I did. Um, I think that he's a fine fit. I think that he is an interesting fit. I still don't know who guards wing. Um, if you want to roll out three guards, uh, I think that Nick Green works. Um, the problem is that he's built very similar to Halley um, and very similar to Fox. So there would still be like the, the serious long-term question of getting another wing of getting a wing who is capable of covering uh, a, wad, a wide swath because I think defensively the concern is that Green and Halliburton have the same overlap of guys they're generally comfortable with. Um, and you'd be asking Fox to either put on weight or to like guard wings. And I, for my conception of this team, I would say that getting a wing defender is a higher priority than getting another scorer for this moment. But if you were to tell me that they had a lot of faith in getting a, a, a wing defender in free agency or that they were simply trying to wait another year for the next class of wing defenders, um, yeah, that that's roughly it. Does that, does that sound fine for you, Robel? Yeah, uh, I don't want to speak too much about the Kings because I barely watch them. So, uh, But it does, I mean, like, it does scare me defensively. <laughs> Like especially because yeah. Darren Fox is not like like he has a certainly potential to be like a point of attack guy and maybe you know like if he if like he theoretically put on weight like good guard maybe up but it hasn't showed up yet so yeah uh check your DM real quick by the way um can you name a couple differences between Jalen's skill level and Gerald and Gerald Green's early in his career um 
Yeah, Gerald couldn't dribble like this. Uh, Gerald didn't have the the passing level. Um, I think Gerald was was always sort of the version of player that he ended up being at his best. Um, but I just think that we're talking about two different types of guys. Um, in terms of what they can do, I mean, in in the piece that uh, we'll be dropping tomorrow. Um, I talk about the difference between uh, Jalen's skill level and J.R. Smith's skill level, and I describe it as like uh, Jalen Green's like basketball ability is suited to like what his actual basketball skills are, much better than a lot of like hyper athletes were, because like his handle works in a specific way that complements his skills. Where like J.R. was a guy who like liked to take tough shots, and he was also capable of doing these base off vert. Um, and like that's just not how the overlap between what Jalen can do and how his game is developed work. Uh, okay, the next question is from uh, Max Club. Uh, I have heard a lot of people use Killer Instinct as the reason to take Green slash Suggs over Mobile Two. Uh, my question is, how much do you value, value Killer Instinct or lack of it when evaluating a prospect? Um, you want to start with this one? <laughs> what does that mean, Killer Instinct? That's what. That's my yeah. That's first thing. Um, I mean, like, 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 what does that mean? Like, how do, how do you know how these kids are wired? Like like 19 years old like come on now like you know like i, I mean think there are guys there are guys like i've talked about this quite a bit there are dudes who are like legitimately wired um to be uh basketball obsessives mm-hmm. um like you know zach levine uh famously a dude who like have to keep out of gyms Kawhi leonard had to you know yeah. be begged to not work out more than three times a day during the off season um but who had but, like the people that say that? Sorry, uh, the people that say that don't have that type of intel. Like they they wouldn't know that. So yeah, we don't like. I mean, I don't like. I don't know about you, but the people that say that, and I feel like it's just like that killer instance thing. It's just very reductive and like evaluating prospects. You know, like they're just not really evaluating talent. They're just saying these cliches. That's what I mostly hate about it. Yeah. So like I can talk about a guy that. Um like the intel or my assumptions proved wrong, which is Emmanuel Moutier, who is a mentality elite guy, a guy who, you know, supposedly lived in the gym, who handled failure really well. And like, I think that was the class where like, sometimes it's not killer instinct. It's just vibes. <laughs> like sometimes it's like, yeah, this dude seems like a nut job or seems like losing really affects him. And then you have guys who like, don't necessarily have those, like they don't seem like hyper competitors or like nut jobs. But they are like Clay Thompson is like that. Clay Thompson really, 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 really does not like losing at basketball. Yeah. But like you'd never look at him and be like, that's a killer. You might say that way when he, you know, drops 50 without dribbling. But like it's just the vibes are not how you would use killer. We would use another term. So like I would just be hesitant to whenever you use, you know, terms to recognize that there are loopholes within them um, and recognize that like sometimes we have a. like styles of how you play basketball or styles of how we carry, how players carry themselves. And that leads to biases. Um, mm-hmm. You know, how many times have you been like, you know, in the early 2000s, there was a Duke player with a terrible haircut. Um, I mean, Kyle Singler was this way. We were like, there's no way this dude is giving you. And then like up and down the ACC, he was just dragging. <laughs> um, so you just have to be like, understand your biases, understand that like sometimes what you're, uh, what you're saying has nothing to like sometimes the, it, it is vibes and as long as you can recognize vibes um um you you will start to evaluate better um because without real intel that's kind of um ray asks thoughts on on slash jackson hayes as holmes's replacement what would you offer for them um man i i don't know if if lana is ready to give up on on Yekka. um but like Jackson Hayes in, in Sacramento really scares me. Like, like I I like it, but I also think it might be like a 2K move where like I like it, but the real world full forces that would need to be in place to make Jackson Hayes work in Sacramento might not be there. So like, I think for like Twitter slash 2K purposes, absolutely love it. Real world. Um, some questions. Uh, a uh, person that me and you have never talked before, not say, said, how do you feel about uh, Jalen Green and the Magic? Keeping in mind he'll have to get uh, a lot 
of muscle. We'll have to get a lot of muscle of the muscle and have a rather heavy creation burden from the jump. Do you think that would reinforce his bad habits? So, Jalen Green to the magic, and how do you feel about that development? Uh, cool. Anthony and Jalen Green making decisions is a little bit uh, scary, and I think our, like the same thing with the Kings. It's like RJ Hampton would have to guard the threes, and he would have to really fill out. And like I don't really love uh, RJ Hampton's frame. Um, like I don't know. It just does. It doesn't really like I, I would prefer Suggs there, but. Uh, I mean, like, it just depends where you're at. Like, obviously, like, at one point, you just best way available is best way available. But, I mean, it's still, like, I do think, like, the latter one you said, like, the bad uh, decision will be enforced. I think uh, when you're around players that are, uh, how do I say it, inconsistent in making right decisions, I think uh, it does also, it does trickle down in the roster especially if you're a rookie. So I think I wouldn't love that. Yeah, I think that it's a good, but not wonder. Like, I think that there's no reason to doubt Jalen Green's fit on the magic, like, in the, like a meaningful sense. I just don't think it's perfect for him. Um, yeah. Because, like, there is quite a bit of overlap in terms of, like, the styles of him and RJ Hampton, him and Mark Ellis. Like, there's just there isn't like a synergistic player that I can point to other than like Jonathan Isaac it kind of works with everybody. But it's pretty low maintenance um, in terms of his usage um, that I'm like, can really believe in. I think that like the that Clifford would help defensively, you know, because Clifford kind of helps everybody defensively, but I'm not, I'm not enthralled with the fit unless they like have a consolidation. Um, I think it'd be fun and overall solid, but it's not like one of the ones where I'm like, Oh, this will elevate his, uh, his, uh, you know, uh, archetype because of the pieces around him and, and the infrastructure. Um, Francis asked, do you think Green will develop as a reliable isolation scorer eventually? Yeah. I mean, I think that you sort of have to believe in that. Like, there's the sidesteps, the step backs, um, NBA spacing. Like, I think that there's a lot there that is, like, and just, like, the level of gravity is going to play. Um, I think that there's going to be a, a team that does draft him that gives him like the the Zion uh, and uh, Anthony Edwards like um, uh, like downhill plays where it's just like okay you're going to catch the ball and be downhill every single time like don't worry about like you're going to be, have primary usage but from secondary uh, catch locations I think that that's going to be his rookie role um and that from there you can start to build up the isolation, isolation package because like it does exist but just the the amount of usage that you want to have from it very much changes from, from team to team like you know there's some teams that think of him as, as a straight primary there's some that think of him as like a straight jet sweep guy and uh i'm probably more in the middle um that i like i want him especially to reinforce those uh, those good decision making um abilities that he has to have as many easy reads as possible um, especially while his frame is developing. But the idea is always to get him done, like from that to isolate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree there. Like, especially with the last part where you said, like, in between, like, a primary, like, an off ball player. I also think uh, it would be very interesting to see how a team, especially if, it, like, a team that drafts him has a playmaking that could use the leverage his off ball, off ball potential. I mm -hmm. think he, he could be a destructive cutter. Uh, I think we've already seen uh, just some some uh, interesting processes of how he moves off the ball. Like I think uh, in just in other games hasn't really been this one other than the the shake uh, play, where like um, he does uh, make try to make the pass easier, like just by a lo little bit of re relocating. And I think that is interesting to me at a young age. Uh, so I think just having that, like I think Francis said as well, like JG uh, he could have used Vucevic. Just like a, a a big that can pass, at, or like a forward that can pass, uh, would be very interesting, uh, with him, and that archetype is just coming more and more in the league, right? So. Okay, so we have uh two Toronto based questions next. Uh, we'll do this as a two parter. Um, the first one is if the Raptors get three, do you prefer Green or Suggs? And the second part is thoughts on Green and Toronto. Uh, I, I prefer green. I think 
when you're the Raptors and you have like a fame, arguably the best uh, development program in the league, you have to take uh, the guy that has the better star bet. And I think it's it's green, in my opinion. Um, I think Toronto has the the best infrastructure. Uh, the like it has an interesting infra- infrastructure to uh, minimize his weaknesses. He can he'll be the worst defender in the lineup. Uh, if you just put him with play with the starters, you have a point of attack guy that commands uh, usage in Fred Van Vliet. So um, it is a place you have like a passing uh, forward slash big and uh, Pascal Siakam. Do you have an OG Anunoby who also warrants some usage? So it's it's not like you just throw him into the fire and be like okay make decisions. It just uh, like I just really want to see him um, just utilize that. Uh, I don't want him to be running a bunch of pick and roll in the game, right? So, no. uh, and I think he helps. Like, I think he helps like playoff aspirations, especially. Uh, but at the end of the day, like Toronto's already won a chip, and I don't think we should be the team should be going all in on this Pascal Fred VanVleet OG uh, trio. So just getting uh, Green that could help with that trio, but like also the next um, iteration of that core. You gotta take a chance on that, and every every like every player that's come through the Raptors has like developed a, a a skill out of nowhere, and I don't know which one that's gonna be with Green. Maybe it's, he's gonna develop the foul draw earlier. Uh, maybe he's gonna be a like a more proactive passer, but I don't know. But like like Stanley Johnson makes like um, great passes. Like Utah Watanabe is like a forty percent shooter. Like after All Star break, it's just like little things like that. Um, it makes me really exciting about how you have a um, a, pros- a prospect with high upside join the team. So I think that's definitely an interesting experiment. So you gotta take green, take that down green. Yeah. Uh, uh, what was the second quest? Did I answer? No, though you got both. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm roughly in the same place. Um, I I think that that's I think that green is a bigger swing than Suggs at three. Um. And sort of, I don't think the Raptors roster right now can handle another guard. Um, like, it's just not the construction. Um, and it would not really make sense with how well they've done it at finding late round guards. Um, okay, the next question that we have. Um, uh, is Drew Holiday a good player comp for Springer? Not really. I mean, I've used uh, uh, guard size OG Ananobi repeatedly. Um, fun. Um, Drew Holiday is also like one of the best high school players I've ever seen. He legitimately pinned a dude's handles to the ground in high school. Terrifying. Um, uh, Drew notes that um, he'd be surprised if, if Green doesn't go number two. I've heard like from the, the teams and the people that I've talked to, you get a pretty good mixture of, of green Mobley and like the occasional Cade at number two. Um, I don't hear that much green at one, but I hear some like Mobley at one, um, depending on, on the group of people that you have. Um, like there are some team construction. Um, I think that, uh, I think that there are teams that are going to be pretty worried about Mobley's weight gain and the, they believe that they can sort of like align Jalen Green's offensive output faster than they could uh, solve most Mobley's physical issues. Um, obviously, Mobley has the movement skills, but it's just like not every team feels great about adding weight onto bigs. It's just everybody has mileage varies on it. Um, I would expect Mobley to go too, um, just based on on the sampling that I have. But like, I think that there are definitely teams that would hire on Green just based on how they evaluate player development and their roster construction. Um, I don't have any intel, so I just agree with PD, so let's keep going. Um, let's see. I think Francis had a good question I was thinking about. Uh, it says something about, let's see, do you believe more than most uh, scoring guard wing prospects that Jalen Green could truly benefit from a structured role in a set-heavy offense to start his career. 
Um, yeah, I mean, this is the the uh, the jet sweep idea. Okay, just you you put people in the first Finch Anthony Edwards roll, the second half of the year Zion roll, uh, and you just simplify reads, um, understanding that like they're going to create a, a bunch of gravity. And you say like, look, there are six sets of, or there are six shoes in this paint. Like you, this is your read every time. That's your read every time, and and you build out from there. Like the idea being like. You take a corner of the world, pick at it, study, you know, grow outward from there. Um, I think so. It also, like, that's the way that his handle. Um, I think that there are guys like Cam Reddish that you sort of want to apply this to. But, like, Cam Reddish's game doesn't necessarily flow to downhill attack. Um, and so I think that just based on on the, like, Tron bike nature of his handle and his explosiveness, um, and I think that it would be easier to build out the foul drawing if they have a consistent set of, um, like if if, it, if the rotations are coming from generally the same places, it makes more sense. I mean, the like ignite gave had a had a very specific set of these plays, and I thought that they were like built onto them well as the season went on in a very wide big or emptying out weak side for for a cut, um, uh, for the for a give and go lob, um. So yeah, I mean, to me, that just based on the way that his handle works, that's a that's a hundred percent yes for me, um, and that it would minimize his exposure to a, a, a certain type of defender that gets him trouble. Is there anyone? I think I had a question. If there is, like on my Twitter, uh, someone said, "Who's the? Don't want to make this a Raptors stream, but who's the best player the Raptors could pick outside the top seven? I'd say, uh, I'd say Springer. I mean, yeah. Springer might go like 29th at this point, apparently. But um, yeah, it got to be Springer. Right? Like, uh, I don't know if Josh Giddy falls there, but I think I think, Giddy, go... I think Giddy will will go like number 10. Okay, so if Giddy was there, like let's say like Giddy goes eight or something like that, and we have the ace pick, and he's still available, I I probably pick Giddy over uh, Springer. I think I think you had you had the screen with that, but. I just want to say my opinion. Um, just the reason is like, I don't want. Uh, I think Pascal is a good primary, but I I just don't like his like. I think he's he's developed as a good reactive passer, but uh, he's he's more like um, a gravity and then make a decision. He's not a guy that uh, could exploit passing windows. And Fred Van Vliet is also gonna be the high usage point guard and. Uh, I think his playmaking struggles are well documented if you're a Raptors fan. So I think I'd be much more interested in a Josh Giddy who also could be uh like if he doesn't turn into like uh, a star, I think he'd still be more interested in a interesting as a um how do I say it, like a connecting piece. Yeah. At a size. Whereas like Springer, um, like he's gonna be like a second side creator, but it's it's not gonna be. Um, it's not gonna fix the the Fred Van Vliet and Pascal like uh, creating for others issue. You know what I mean? Like 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 you said, like it's like guard size Ananobi, but Ananobi's like he doesn't fix those issues really either. He just he just learned to get it by himself, right? So I think that's why I'd probably prefer um, Giddy over Springer. But I mean, like <laughs> I'd still be happy with both. Yeah, I, I lean Springer in uh, just uh, the overlap of having a small wing. I can do those things at the top eight valuable. Um, mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's been my general stance. Um, Sawyer asked, do you guys have any clue how 6 through 15 is going to play out? The, the draft, these mock is absurd. So I think the thing that happens uh, before the lottery is that like Intel is less firm. So like this guy played well. Okay, so we bump him up. But it's not really based on team need. It's just like we hit spin on tankathon, and like if you do it ten times, like maybe that order sparks different results. Like until things get firm, you're gonna get wild results and wild mock drafts just because need is not firm. And once need firms, then there's more legitimate feedback. Like okay, if everybody in the top five needs guards, and nobody from six to fifteen does. Like Davion Mitchell has a ceiling. Um, that's that's important to. To sort of parse out how um how like messy this will be until the lottery happens so 
sort of like trying to glean the information that you can from who's working out well, you know, who's uh, who's put on good muscle, who's moving a little bit better, and almost nothing because it's all speculation about what the order will be and how to um, about that order because there is a reflexive property to it. Um, I'm seeing reports that uh, Bryn Forbes um, turned into a supernova. Um, anyone confirm? Uh, the score is currently 84 to 116, and Shoot. Bryn Forbes has 22 on 8 for 12 shooting, 6 for 9 for 3. No free throws, just just all shots. I respect it. Five sets of thirty. Um, maybe until for twenty five hours, he's the best player in the league. We'll say that. Yeah, Francis notes that teams don't do any real draft work until May, outside of that, and and prospects. Maybe, yeah, that's it seems like. Um, uh, Doctor Doom asks, uh, would Jalen Green benefit from another year that he would rather play in the NBA? Friday? Oh, he needs to play. In the yeah. Um, uh, multiple years of the G League is for a specific type of guy um, who has a specific, uh, like, you need to lower the punishment ceiling for their mistakes. Like a guy like Poku early, like, he couldn't get to the cup and get fouled, so they lowered the, the competition threshold, lower like, what it would take to get to the rim by putting him in the G League until he figured it out, until he figured out what worked at, at this new competition level. Built up. Like, Green's, Green can compete at an NBA level. His issues aren't don't require a lowering of the competition for the expectation for. Um, it's just a matter of, of, of reps and building a system that minimizes the downside while forcing it into positive decision making uh, feedback loops. Uh, let's go a couple more questions in and get out of here. Um, Bobby Portis doing a interesting. Um, yeah. A, a final call. What's the difference? Biggest difference between Joe Green and Jalen Green at the same relative age? Uh, I'm gonna leave that to you because I don't know. Yeah, you were like seven years. Old. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's just the handle level. Like it, the handle level is is really different. And uh, Gerald Green wasn't like an optimized player. I mean, I don't think that he was a primary at that age. Like for real. Um, you know, in the Pre UIBL landscape. If you play for your high school team and you were the best player, you were a primary, regardless of like whether your skills were not, were there or not. Um, so I think that he was always cast to a guy who had primary athleticism, like a second set or first or whatever. whatever. Um, it's difficult. Um, okay, so uh, we'll we'll go with uh, these last two questions here. Um, what are the best prospects in the nineteen to twenty three range? I'll let you I'll let you pick that one out first. Uh, Sharif Cooper is number one, just to get someone else uh, to get to the rim. And uh, Randall has quietly like not been like a super like amazing driver to the basket. And I just want like a point guard that can get to the rim for them, get easy looks for everyone else. I think that is very important. And whether the shooting gets fixed or not, like I agree with you, PD. It's like. I think it's it's not like impossible, and I think it's just so like I think it's so messed up that it's not like just a like a, a smaller tweak will do uh, wonders. Uh, but like yeah, the rim pressure and just like the passing is just amazing at the size, and you gotta take that that bet, especially at like nineteen twenty three, of course. Yep, same answer. You get the best point card on the board. Um... Can't have another year of Elton Payton with real minutes if you're going to be a playoff team. Yeah. Um, who do you think is going to benefit slash suffer most once measurements come? Oh, that's a good one. Oh, that's so I got to you, shout out to you. Um, honestly, I have to think about that one. Um, I mean, you I'm could just really... do you could just do names that come to mind. It doesn't have to be like the the best and the worst. Just like names you think will will struggle, names you think won't. You can do a little free association back and forth. Hmm. Um, I will say like uh, Giddy will have some uh, like he's going to have both up and down because he's going to measure tall but also with short arms um, and I think a thing that happens with everybody with short arms is you tell yourself that 
the arms are not as short as you think, and you're like, oh, it's not going to be that bad. And then, like, getting the actual measurement, it's only a bit of cold water. Um, but I think that's going to be somebody who's hurt. I think Isaiah Jackson is going to be very much help. Um, I think if that is a must, uh, Matherin, yeah. if he was, if he actually went into the draft this year, I think he'd be hurt pretty bad. Uh, because he's 6'5 when he's measured at 6'7. I think like two inches is a pretty big deal. So um, yeah. that was, was my biggest one, but he didn't declare, sadly. Yeah, I mean, I think that like you're, I think Cade is going to be a, a huge winner. Um, because Cade's going to measure large and going to measure tall with long arms and, uh, going to, to uh, put up some football numbers in terms of the, the physical development stuff. Um, I think that if you want to go like into like free phone and stuff, like Moody's going to have trouble with like the change of direction stuff. Um, Scotty's going to have trouble with the athleticism stuff. Like, um, there are guys where like, I don't think this is going to be a, like a big span one. I think we're going to be guys who like obviously, we don't have the full medicals out yet, but um, there's going to be more movement stuff than the wingspan stuff. Um, okay, and then the last one is uh, is who are you thinking about doing the next stream on? The next stream, um, I'm pretty sure it's Friday, and it's going to be on Jonathan. Um, the uh, controversial form. Let's go with that. Yeah. The hope from Congo. Yeah. Um, say that. So that's that's gonna be this Friday, we're still figuring out a time in the cast. Um I'm going to uh figure out what's going on with audio. They just drive me nuts. <laughs> I can't do another six hour session. People who are here for Rocco, can you tell me if it was worse than Rocco? Like real quick. Just, just be real. If it was about the same, I'm gonna start screaming. But yeah, <laughs> just uh, some feedback about how the middle section audio was compared to last time. Um, man, this doesn't make sense. I like I thought that the audio thing was really cool. Um, anybody who was here, Francis Sawyer, Mike, anybody? Let's see. Okay, while well, we wait for chat to uh, to uh, go back and forth on that, Robel, do you have anything you want to plug before we get out of here? Uh, yeah, uh, Free Palestine, uh, subscribe to PD's YouTube channel, subscribe to my channel, so me and Coach. Let's get PD 250 subscribers ASAP, and I need that to happen, and yeah, that's it. Yeah, um, for me, if you can subscribe to the Patreon, that'd be wonderful. If you can use your, um, uh, if you can use your uh, Amazon Prime sub to subscribe, that'd be wonderful. Um, if you can subscribe and like on YouTube, that'd be wonderful. Um, I will have the piece for this out tomorrow morning. Uh, it ran a little bit long, and, and I wanted to put some extra time into this one. Um, appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to, uh, to try to make this as good as possible for you guys because I think that it is a, a good educational tool. Um, I want to thank everybody who stuck around till the end. Uh, thank you so much. Um, appreciate y'all. Have a, uh, have a great night.